It's the final week of trading on Wall Street for the third quarter. And the, this month has been awful for the stock market. We've seen the S&P 500 drop 4%. The NASDAQ is down over 6%. Will the selling continue? Well, our featured guest today on Buy, Hold, Sell actually is quite optimistic for the fourth quarter and beyond. Welcome, everyone, to the show. I am your trader, Todd Schoenberger, and I am joined by my friend and co-host, Tobin Smith, out in sunny and hot Scottsdale, Arizona. Sunny and, and warm, friends, Todd. Sunny and sunny, warm, not hot, for crying out loud. Sunny and warm. Sunny and warm and probably less humid as well, but that's awesome. Yes. If you even, I doubt you even get any humidity, actually, out there, but who knows? But listen, we have a very special guest with us who's returning to buy, hold, sell. He is the chief U.S. equity strategist at CFRA Research, Sam Stovall. Sam, welcome back to the program. Happy to be here, Todd. Good to talk to you again, Toby. Same here. Absolutely. Well, Sam, we've seen you all over the news lately. A lot of the guests that we've had on Buy, Hold, Sell recently have been, I would say, on the negative side, the bearish side. Uh, we had uh, somebody on the show recently who said the 10-year yield is likely going to hit five and a quarter percent. I mean, a lot of negatives that are out there. The UAW strike, you have so many things that we have to worry about, so many headwinds. But you seem optimistic, or did we misunderstand, or do you tell the audience? No, I think that when I look to the fourth quarter, uh, I am a bit optimistic. I mean, I am somebody who likes to follow history using that as a guide, obviously never gospel. Uh, and, you know, my feeling is if everybody is willing to give me lemons, I'm happy to turn them into whiskey sours. Excellent. Excellent. That felt well, rehearsed, Sam. That felt rehearsed. <laughs> Maybe Absolutely. I've liked it before. Yeah. Well, Todd, I'll, I'll tell you this. I, I now always say, if you invested in a mutual fund or a stock, whatever, and it's down 3% in the first month, and you're scared to death, you shouldn't have been in that damn thing in the first place. Um, you know, we the only way that we get expansions in the value of the stock market is to have contractions at the stock in the stock market. That's as, you know, just like breathing in and out. Um, and I do think, honestly, that from 2010 to 2022, no one saw, you know, anything other than, you know, a five week crash in the pandemic that it would change your attitude that you always buy the dip. Stocks always go up in value. That valuation doesn't matter because, you know, this is zero interest. But when you got five and a quarter, which is my number uh, on the 10 year, look what happened this last two or three weeks. The stocks that were most down were the no earnings stock, uh, you know, tech stock. Well, gosh, why is that? Well, maybe the people at home actually don't use discounted present value of future earnings, et cetera, but actual professional investors do. And I know when I ran a mutual fund, when I would come in and I'd say, well, here's what we're buying, here's what we're selling, the manager of the whole thing would say, well, what's your valuation? And if I didn't have a good answer for it, he'd say, er, next. So, you know, let the professionals work right now and, and let the people sort of sit on their hands. And, and that's probably the best thing, in my humble opinion. OK, so, Sam, so we have oil prices that are shooting to the moon again. It's a big worry for for Americans right now, especially going into what should be the, the peak spending season uh, with the holidays coming up. But what do you think? I mean, we had August and September. The narrative completely changed with the Fed here. We were thinking we were going to have possible rate cuts. Market shot higher. We had two letters that sent this that sent the stock market up, which was A.I., but now it does seem like there are some negatives. I mean, Toby brings up contraction, but I guess we weren't, ex contraction's healthy, but with so many headwinds that are going on, I mean, should we just ignore everything and think that things are gonna just move higher going forward? Well, I think you have to realize that uh, about a couple of months ago, people were saying, well, you know, it probably would be good if we end up with a digestion of gains, but I would be buying into that weakness. Well, what is going to cause the digestion of gains to be triggered? It's when the uh, estimates, the forecasts start to change, when people start to lose conviction in what they felt was the driving force for the market over the intermediate to longer term. We're seeing that now with, as you said, uh, spike in oil prices, much higher 10-year uh, yield. And Toby, just to let you know, the average 10-year yield going back to 1953 was about five and a quarter percent. Right, exactly. I just saw that so, like yesterday. Essentially, we're going back to... Uh, um, what Ed Yardini calls the old normal. Yeah. Uh, 
and also looking then at the dollar strength, looking at concerns that, gee, maybe the Fed will have to raise rates twice this year, not just one more time. I think th those are the things that are causing investors to re-examine their estimates, re-examine their optimism. And that's why we are in now a pullback mode, a 5 to 10% decline in the S&P 500. All sizes, all styles are in negative territory, along with 10 of 11 sectors and 82% of the 153 sub-industries in the S&P 1500. So yeah, we're, we're resetting the dials, which is what we need to do since bull markets take the stairs and bear markets take the elevator. You got it. Hey, Sam, do you, I, I don't know, I've always had this, I've been a, a new highs, new lows watcher for a long time because uh, it really shows me, you know, where the shifts are. Um, for instance, we got seriously into uranium earlier this year uh, for a variety of fundamental reasons. But then all of a sudden, I started seeing uranium stocks on 52-week highs. Man, that, that sector had been dead for 12, 14 years. Um it seems like there's micro segments th that we're doing well in right now. Uh, but when seven stocks represented almost all of the gains, right, for the S&P 500 or NASDAQ or NDX, whatever you want to call it, wasn't that narrowness? I know I know, bull markets have narrow tops. That's how they work. But wasn't that extreme narrowness when, when now 84% this morning of, of all traded stocks are under their 50-day moving average? Well, it's interesting to say that it's the Magnificent Seven, but actually by July 31st, uh, you ended up with a good two thirds of all companies in the S&P 500 in positive territory. Yeah. Uh, they just weren't as doing as well as the Magnificent Seven. Um, you also had more than 90% of the sub-industries uh, above their 50-day moving average, which is traditionally an overbought sign. So right now, in a sense, we're going the other way. Uh, we're only looking at about 17% of the companies in the 500 above uh, in positive territory this year. And so a lot have been giving back uh, those gains as we digest what we experienced since the October 12th low of last year. So um, I just sort of feel that, you know, we are going through this digestive phase. Yes, uh, there are concerns about the largest companies, the behemoths really being the ones that are driving all of this. But at the same time, they're the ones that are seeing the greatest declines because they have the most profits to attempt to protect. I would love, Sam, to ask you to define for, let's say, your aunt, what overbought means. Because, I, you know, for years we've used the word overbought. And I've always described it as, as just basically everybody who had to buy bought, every algorithm that had to buy bought, and there's just sort of nobody left to, you know, to make a, a buy in, in a big way. How about you? Yeah. Well, Colombian co coffee now being served on the starboard deck. If you start to see the ship, <laughs> the boat shift to the right, well, then you know that it's it, that coffee is oversold. So uh, or overbought. In a you way. are so dating yourself, Snowball. That ad hasn't been on television in 30 years. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, it reminds me of the kind of coffee they served on the Titanic. Sanka. <laughs> yeah, Sanka. <laughs> I, Todd, I've never been a setup man like this before. I mean, this is this is this is just un, unheard of. Pretty, pretty incredible. Well, you brought up Ed Yardeni. Um, he was on buy hold sell about a month ago. He actually had a um, forty six hundred uh, target on the S and P five hundred by year end. What is your target on the S and P? Well, I don't want to go over because I want to get the washer and dryer. Uh, <laughs> 4575 is actually the target that I set in the second week of December of 22. Uh, basically looking at history, what happens in pre-election years, uh, looking at what happens following a uh, decline in the S&P. We were down 19.5%. Historically, when you have a down year followed by an up January barometer and a first quarter low that did not exceed the prior December low, we were up 100% of the time since World War II with the average price change being a gain of 25%. So the market told us early on that this was going to be a very good year and that, interestingly enough, the worst performing sectors, communication services, consumer discretionary and tech, would likely be among the better performing sectors in 2023. Well, well you know, okay. that also brings up the issue of overbought and oversold, right? So, um, uh, I, again, I think people sort of 
don't really get the fact that if you, there's a couple of indexes or a couple of measurements that say how much cash is coming in every day, 401k, pension, you know, so on and so forth. And when you got, as you say, you couldn't, you know, there was obviously buying power at the bottom of that range. Uh, the money had to go somewhere. It couldn't be in cash. Again, I when I, even today, when I ran a, a mutual fund, I get my ass in the, in the kicker if I had more than two and a half percent of cash. You know, most actively managed mutual funds, for instance, they, they, they can't hold cash. If you're a pension, you're a hedge fund, that's a whole other thing. But I, you, you so were right that that historically, 100 percent of the time when you get that pulled down, that said there's buyers there. And when the volume turned up and the price moving average turned up, then to me, that told the algos and that told the, the you know the, all the robots out there, all right, we've had a reversal, we've had a bottom, you know, buy, buy, buy. Well, you were also discussing the number of shorts that are out there. And with so many people leaning uh, for further market decline, uh, as you had said, should there be any kind of positive news that interrupts that trade, they're going to have to be running for the exits all at the same time. And what would make you change your 4575 number? Would you go to 4576 if it was really good? I mean, I'm just saying, what, <laughs> what would make you change your uh, perspective? Well, first off, I, I don't readjust the year end target because my 12 month target is what I offer to the market, but also okay. to our analysts, because what they do is make buy, hold and sell recommendations for the coming 12 month period. So if they have my target as uh, a benchmark, if you will, and I tell them it's more of a weather vane than it is a laser beam. So, you know, it gives you a guide as to where I think the market will be 12 months from now. Right now, I'm looking at 4820. Uh, 12 months down the road, and that target will probably have to be changed shortly and uh, more likely to the upside than the downside. So, the so hold on. 20, does that have a a Fed cut in it? Does that have the dollar, you know, coming yeah. back to earth? Are there other macro pieces of that? Yes. <laughs> uh, it, well, thank it, you very much. It's been great to have you here, Sam. Great. Good to <laughs> it has the uh, the Fed raising rates one more time this year. Uh, and uh, probably end up pausing for a good nine months, which is typically what the Fed does between the last rate hike uh, and the first rate cut is usually uh, nine months. What we also find is that we're expecting earnings to start to improve in this third quarter, expectations for a less than 1% decline. Yet if you look back over the last 56 quarters, 54 of them showed that actual results exceeded end of quarter estimates. So mm -hmm. I would not be surprised at all if the third quarter numbers ended up being positive. We're looking for 8.5% growth in the fourth quarter and more than 12% growth in 2024. So I think investors in the latter part of this year, fourth quarter, they're going to say, I'm not bothering to look anymore at year end. I'm going to look at the end of 2024. And let's face it, anything, even Toby looks good from that far away. <laughs> well, hold on. <laughs> that's awesome. And, and you're absolutely right on that one, Sam. But <laughs> I let's unpack all this because I'm, I'm trying to take the notes in my head here. So you're saying that the earnings for the, for the third quarter, we're looking at minus 1%. For we'll see earnings contraction in the S and P five hundred. Did I hear you correctly? Correct. Less than and then you're less than one percent. But fourth quarter, you're seeing eight and a half percent growth. That's correct. And is that on a market cap basis, Sam? This is uh, actually it's S and P capital IQ consensus estimates, okay. and it is cap weighted basis for the S and P five hundred. So this is what the street is anticipating at this point, and the earnings growth picture is actually improving as the weeks progress, not receding. So that, along with the fact that our economists are saying yes, we could have a bit of a slowdown in economic growth, about 1% plus in the third, uh, fourth quarter of this year, first quarter of next year, but then seeing an improvement in successive quarters of 2024. Um, my belief is that this resetting of the dials that we're experiencing now that mm -hmm. probably will go into the early part of October, maybe even drag the S&P down to 4,200, which would be uh, about an 8.4% pullback, as I call it. But I remind investors that on average, it's taken the S&P 500 only a month and a half to recover everything that it lost in the 61 pullbacks since World War II.
That's that's an amazing stat. I also think, yeah. Sam, I don't know about you, but I it, uh, I spent a fair amount of time in Silicon Valley and have a lot of contacts and people there. Um, and when I was talking with someone from Google yesterday, they were telling me, Toby, you got to remember, this office used to be jammed. Well, we fired 15% of our of our people, and the average uh, you know salary for there was two hundred thirty six thousand dollars a year plus plus. And that's the same, at, at, Apple's really the only one who hasn't had the bloodletting, but that's Microsoft, that's all. So if the big guys whose earnings have a 10 or 12 X multiplier effect based on you know what the EPS for the entire S&P is gonna be, and they cut their biggest expenses, Facebook was another one that's down 15% on overhead or you know labor, um, you would expect, I don't think the market has recognized how much they cut because Facebook you know, obviously just got crushed uh, on their bad earnings issues, but they'd cut 15%. All of a sudden, they had about the same amount of sales and their EPS were up 25% because they got over $230,000 average people. I don't know about you, but if I was 22 and I was making 230 grand and I was in Silicon Valley, I would never go to work. I, I just, I, I'd call in and I'd say, oh, I'm working my ass off here, Bob, working my ass off. So yeah, that yeah. has not been factored in, in my opinion. So it sounds as if you're saying that the profit margins will be expanding uh, as we move into 2024. You are you are as smart as you look, Sam. <laughs> well, Pretty incredible. I, and I think that's what the street is saying as well. So yeah. um, I, I believe also that if we end up, um, if this bull market, like the messenger from Marathon, uh, collapses <laughs> from exhaustion uh, after recording that 20% advance on June 8th, uh, it will be the first time since 1948 that we actually had a bull market that lasted only about a year. Um, certainly not a guarantee that it's not going to happen, but my belief is that we will likely see this bull market at least celebrate its second birthday. Uh, and if we're going to have any problems, maybe it'll be in the third year, but certainly not before we uh, complete at least year one. Well, just quickly. So one thing I've always been intrigued about on historical context is, yeah, but we didn't have a pandemic in there. You know, you didn't have a, a, a historic Fed rate hike since the 80s, um, which changes, you know, the macro. Um, but how does long term history overcome those short term historical events? Well, you're right. Basically, every uh, bear market uh, and especially every mega meltdown uh, has been triggered by something different. Uh, it was the OPEC oil embargo of 1973. Okay. It was tech trading at 60 times forward earnings, and we still think uh, thought that they uh, tech stocks were cheap. Um, it was you know the housing and the credit crisis in 07. Um, so basically, whatever is going to cause the next mega meltdown bear market will be something completely different. But one element that is consistent with every bull and bear market since the beginning of time is human involvement, yeah. human emotional human reactions. Yeah. Uh, and amazingly, you know, we know that fear and greed are the two emotions that drive the market with fear being a greater motivator than greed. I measure that because I say that the fifth, um, whenever we've been in a bull market mode, only 15% of the days trading days had movements of 1% or more. Yet whenever the S&P was off by 20% or more, 44% uh, of those days had volatility of 1% or more. So, you know, I, I think as uh, you know, we realize that in this day and age of instant information, unfortunately, we can experience both fear and greed at the exact same moment. I, I've always used the term now that it's only fear. There's only one motivation. There's fear of loss, or and there's fear, fear of missing out. out. It's out, right? And 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 greed is is you know a function of fear of missing out, right? A driver. But I, I, I you know, listen. I I always expect you to have a professor hat on because I think you absolutely nailed the the point. You know, going back to the 1890s when you were born, that um, the stock market uh, at the end of the day. Uh, on the, I guess when you started, you had to yell across the pit, buy 12, buy 12. But, you know, now <laughs> FOMO, you can hit the button and now you're fully invested in three and a half seconds. Um, you have the meme stock. You have to watch the movie Dumb Money. I think you'll absolutely, it'll blow your mind. I just saw it last night. 
Um, it's about the meme stocks, Todd. If I know you don't get out much, Todd, so I just want to share with you that. that, that. <laughs> and um, but uh, uh, I, I guess the message I'm trying to say to people, our subscribers, et cetera, is you want the pull back. You don't want the melt up. Melt ups are short covering. They're, they're, they're mechanics that have nothing to do with valuation, with the future, discounting 12 months ahead, whatever you want to say it. But there are mechanical parts of the stock market that if you really want to understand them, then it will make you less fearful on the mm -hmm. pullbacks. Oh, absolutely. Uh, last March, I gave a two-hour presentation at the Securities Industry Institute at the Wharton School. My uh, presentation was titled Using Stock Market History as Virtual Valium, because by understanding <laughs> stock market history, it actually can calm your nerves uh, because you know what is likely yeah. to be occurring. That's it. That, yeah, that's this is point. Once again, I get stuffed by Stovall. I'm making a really great point that it comes out <laughs> with virtual value. That's awesome. Well, he's absolutely right, though. And I, I got to say, you're calming my nerves. But um, but the people that are fear of missing out are our advertisers right now. So let's okay. cut it on this break, <laughs> on this block. And we're, we're going to come back in the next block with Sam. And um, we're going to ask him, uh, and really, what are the headwinds that we really are not talking about? But we'll get into those risks um, after the break. So please stay with us. Buy, hold, sell, brought to you by Crosscheck Management. We give game day a whole new meaning. Business. In brief, Bloomberg Briefs puts the power of Bloomberg to work for you with over 15 industry specific newsletters available only by subscription. Each offers proprietary data researched and written by acknowledged experts. Top analysts, dedicated economists, senior business editors, all presented in a concise, uncluttered environment. It gives me the edge I need. Go to BloombergBriefs.com right now for your free 30 day trial. Welcome back to Buy, Hold, Sell. Well, we saw the markets actually were somewhat up today um, on this final trading week of, the, of September as well as the third quarter. But our guest today is very optimistic, not just for the fourth quarter, but also well into 2024. Sam Stovall from CFRA Research is still with us on the show. From Muhlenberg College, I got to say, home of the Muhlenberg Mules, who are 3-0 right now. Toby, I don't know if you know this, but Sam played football for Muhlenberg. Many, many moons look ago, at, though. Look, look at that <laughs> punim for crying out loud. He didn't he didn't play table tennis, okay? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, Sam, we got to ask you. Here, you know, it's pre-election year. Um, everything you were saying, we had Jeffrey Hirsch from the Stock Traders Almanac on. He is very optimistic. He actually said that the high of the year is going to happen either on the second or second to last or last trading day of the year. I mean, incredible prediction. You're you're very optimistic, but what are are there any headwinds right now? Because it can't be that easy to think the stock market is just going to go north. Oh, absolutely. There are an awful lot of headwinds. I mean, we listed them in the first block of this program, uh, higher oil prices. I remember our economist David Weiss from S&P used to say that for every $10 increase in the price of oil, it takes off about 20 basis points of real GDP growth over an extended right. period. So yes, that could be a concern. We are seeing uh, higher debt levels for consumers. 
Of course, they're not uh, out of the woods yet in terms of uh, they're still very willing to spend. It's very hard to get a, a dinner reservation uh, in the area on a Friday or a Saturday night, uh, but that could end up being a concern. There are a lot of could-bes out there, and I was hearing an awful lot of them this morning on a financial radio show where the anchors as well as the guests we're essentially saying, you know, the world is coming to an end at midnight. Tune in tomorrow to see if it really did. So there are yeah. concerns out there, but that's the reason why the market is retreating, uh, because a lot of these concerns are valid. Um, but I believe that we are getting to a point where, from an emotional perspective, maybe we're overdoing it and we could end up setting ourselves up for a nice end of year rally. Well, you know, Sam, it's funny you mentioned the the, the 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 twenty basis points of GDP per you know ten dollar price. I always come back and say, yeah, but when you go back into most of the history, the United, the United States, we we didn't have fracking of oil. We didn't. We weren't the export. We weren't the largest exporter of oil in the world. We were the largest importer for during those times. So in theory, shouldn't you update your you know, long-term history for the actual, because our GDP is up because of that. The second one that gets me is, is you know, inflation rate as it relates to uh, labor costs, both service, but obviously service costs is a big issue. Um, when we, uh, when you know, if you go back to history, we had not, we had more workers than we had jobs, more workers, more jobs. Okay. Then, you know, the world shifted. And now, because of the boomers like me, uh, you know, turning 65 or 70, 15,000 a day till 2031, right? Um, we don't have enough labor. We don't have enough immigration. And and those to me, you know, I, I love the word sticky, but those are sticky problems. They don't go away unless we just fly to Venezuela and, you know, get 700,000 college graduates from Venezuela. Maybe that'll help. But the, the world is different macroeconomic today than it was in any other, you know, scenario. Um, how does that factor into your historical perspective? Well, good point. Uh, when uh, David Weiss actually introduced that concept to me, he was talking about 25 basis points. So I've simply been reducing that number because of what you've been saying about we are a, a net exporter of energy. But still, you know, when you're dealing with more than what, 60 percent of uh, the global GDP being off our own shores, uh, then oil prices do actually matter. So I was just saying that uh, I believe that some of the headwinds out there are concerns that are real. However, uh, I, I still believe, as you were saying about fracking, about us being a net exporter, et cetera, that they don't mean as much as they used to in the past. Yeah. Uh, ditto, we're much more of a service-oriented economy today by, what, 90% or so than a, a, a manufacturing economy. So a lot of those factors have been uh, making changes as to why we are not getting the V-shaped recessions uh, on average that we used to uh, and that they end up recovering more quickly. All right. Well, I, you know, I, you've been so right on so many of these these pieces. I hate to kiss your butt that way, but it is true. Um, <laughs> and and it's intriguing to me that sort of historically, as you as you get back to the core, human behavior doesn't change. Um, and and if that's the core of the behavior that you're you know following, um, and and then you, you do you use any technical analysis in your forecast? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. When I come up with my target price, I look at three things. First off, what does history tell me? And I started to mention that in the earlier block, saying that because last year was a down year, because we had good early indicators, that that said to me we were going to have a good 2023. I look to uh, fundamentals. Um, I like to say that fundamentals tell you what, but technicals tell you when and how far. We have more than 100 analysts at CFRA who are covering uh, hundreds of stocks. Yeah. And as a result, I take their target price forecasts and come up with, well, on a market cap weighted basis, what does that imply for the market 12 months from now? And then I do technical analysis, a lot of point and figure on stocks within the S&P 500, looking at their target prices from a technical perspective, taking that on a cap weighted average to then get a good idea for what does history say? What do our analysts say? What do uh, the technicians say as to what is likely to happen uh, in the year ahead? And if you looked at this morning's notes, 
uh, I had mentioned that there were a couple of technical reasons why I felt that, you know, maybe we do have some more downside to go. One was referencing Fibonacci retracement levels. Right. Uh, another was a lot of people have been saying that we have just uh, broken the neckline on a head and shoulders for the S&P 500. So thereby taking the difference between the shoulder and the head, turn that upside down, would bring us to the low 4,000 area on the S&P. Wow. Again, uh, being a, a normal pullback or a very yeah. correction. Well, on point the trigger quickly, I know you used to do it on a tablet with a, a chisel and stuff. But explain the point and figure to the home audience. Well, now you're going into a, an area that uh, basically point and figures are X's and, and uh, O's, sort of like football, if you will, uh, that are used to measure the price movements over a period of time. And they can actually provide you with direction and a target price based on those patterns to say, well, you know, down the road, and it's usually about a year from now, uh -huh. those point and figure targets will say what this stock, this index is worth. Either it's a bullish trend or a bearish trend. And here is where the projected terminus is. Well, okay. I still use point and figure, but it is when I look at the X's and O's, it does crack me up because I, I used to see the guys in, you know, the twenties, like, you know, crossing up with their pencil and, you know, doing the, yeah. I don't know how it works about laser printing. That's all I'm saying. Well, well you it worked yesterday for the Cardinals. You keep thinking they're hugs and kisses. That's all. <laughs> right. yeah. There you go. Sam, let's, let's close out the show. I want to ask you about politics. You have the, the presidential election next year and for an incumbent uh, history tells us that this should be a, a great period for not just the markets, but as well as the economy. Can you give the audience some historical data points as far as, what uh, how the markets have performed in that final quarter of a pre-election year? Sure. Well, actually, uh, when you look at the final quarter of a pre-election year for a first term president, the market uh, posted a total return. So price plus dividend of 5.7 percent. So nearly an average of 6 percent growth. And it rose 100 percent of the time. Also, in the presidential election year itself, uh, we saw a 100% frequency of advance. Now, if you say, well, let's take out this first term presidency stuff. Let's look at all fourth quarters of pre-election years. Uh, then you're dealing with an 88 or near 90% frequency of advance. Yes, you might get one or two times in which we did not see an advance. Um, and again, even if it was 100%, I would say that's not a guarantee. It's simply an encouraging guide. So does your analysis look into the political party or is that completely irrelevant? Well, you could look at the party, but the problem is that if you put too many if statements in, then you end up with a, only a handful of observations. Then you really start to question the veracity of the output because- yeah. Um, you just don't have enough observations. Um, I would also say that in many cases, um, like with government shutdowns, um, we've had 20 since 1976, and essentially the market sort of yawned whenever that happened. We rose more frequently than we fell during these shutdowns. The longest shutdown, which occurred back in 2018-19, the market was up 9.5% during that period. So I, I, I believe uh, because shutdowns typically start on or just before the weekend, that it ends up angering tourists more than it does traders. <laughs> sure of that. Uh, the UAW strike, uh, the, I mean, the longer it goes, it's clearly a negative, but uh, I mean, how, how much time do we have until it becomes a major issue for the stock market? Well, I think both sides want to resolve the issue as quickly as possible, uh, and they both want to have bragging rights. Um, so, yeah, I think it'll end up getting resolved more quickly than some of the bears would indicate. Uh, and I really question, based on uh, what is agreed upon, you know, what kind of an impact that's going to have on car prices, because maybe we end up seeing... Uh, the uh, cars have longer lives uh, as a result of prices. We've already had the problems because of the pandemic, et cetera. We were just beginning to see discounts once again. 
Um, so, you know, that might end up delaying when we end up with discounts down the road. But you end up seeing a, a, a decline in auto prices because of the improvement in the quality of the autos. Uh, as an input into inflation measures, actually, the automobile has been going down in price, essentially, or uh, down in its input because of the improvements, airbags, safety, backup cameras, et cetera. Uh, that really are not being shown in the price of those automobiles. And, uh, yeah, well, one caveat that the average auto loan rate was 2.6% for, I don't know, the last eight, nine years. And now that same auto loan, depending on your credit, if you're AAA credit, it's still 11%. Um, and But maybe leasing overcomes that. The other thing I'd say is obviously, again, 70s, 80s, auto manufacturing of the total GDP was a significant number. And today, it is not a significant number, except if you live in Michigan or Tennessee. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so um, uh, you know, it's 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 intriguing to me that way how how we've changed. And now, what over seventy six percent consumer, and and of that, you know, uh, a huge number is services, blah blah blah, and manufacturing. It has a ripple effect. I mean, again, if you're in Michigan or Tennessee, et cetera, I I used to buy these companies for private equity and you go to the knock on the door and hey bob how you doing how's the ball bearing business well i'm selling ford all the ball bearings i can get they can get do the kids want to take that business over hell no they're going to university of michigan they don't want to be in the ball bearing business right so you have this ecosystem of large small and tiny manufacturers that all feed that but these mm -hmm. things never last long todd because th th there's number one they can't because they only last as long as the money they have stowed in the bank in their checking account at the at the benefits plan that they pay them five hundred bucks a, a week in cash. To right. Keep the water. But as soon as that money runs out, it's shocking, Todd, that within eight days <laughs> average, those things you know are over. So I I think people are pretty aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. So all right, Sam. So um, the audience wants to know when they're going to see you next. Now, yeah, I know you have some appearances coming up with the Money Show. Can you tell the audience when they are? Yes, uh, October uh, 5th, I'm going to be on a virtual uh, Money Show program. So uh, if you go to moneyshow.com, you can see uh, the virtual programs, but also in-person Orlando Money Show. I'll be speaking twice on uh, Sunday, October 30th. Uh, and then in Sarasota, Florida, in early December, I'll be speaking also about outlook for the market, as well as discussing uh, sector rotation strategies. So three events in the, uh, in the coming three months. Outstanding. Well, it's always a good time to be down in Florida, too, at that time uh, of the year. So that's, that's you know, great. No, when Sam dude. says sector rotation strategy, that just sounds sexy to me. I, I, I want to go down and see that. <laughs> <laughs> That's outstanding, no doubt about it. Well, Sam, you were outstanding as always on Buy, Hold, Sell. We can't thank you enough for joining us today and uh, definitely can't wait to have you back on the show. So you doing brother. great. Definitely. So on behalf of Sam Stovall and Tobin Smith, I am Todd Schoenberger. Thanks again for joining us today on Buy, Hold, Sell. We'll catch you next time. Take care. Buy, right, Hold, great, Sell yeah. brought to you by Crosscheck Management. I want you to smash that like button. <laughs>